Plants in Our Backyards program, Feeding, Observing, and Preserving, program part one. My name is Sandy Fiblecorn. I'm a friend of the Cornwall Library and an avid birder. Some of you may see me around the village monitoring eastern bluebird boxes between the middle of April and early August. I'd like to introduce you to Bethany Sheffer, the naturalist at Sharon Audubon. She has prepared this afternoon's presentation. And before turning the program, Bethany, here she is, up in your upper right-hand corner. Um, before turning the program over to her, though, two guidelines. Remember that with so many people registered, we have had to mute your microphones. So if you have questions, be sure to enter them into the chat area, and we will answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. So it's all yours, Brittany. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Sandy. Um, first, let me just express wholeheartedly how much of a pleasure it is to be here with so many of you today. Um, really, the Cornwall Library deserves all the credit and all the wonderful promotions their team did to be able to get the word out about this program. So thank you all for being here with us on a Saturday afternoon. Um, as Sandy said, we are going to be um, talking about uh, a few different things in today's presentation as we move along. We're going to be going over some intro terminology, like what does it mean to be a migrant and what does it mean to be a resident? We're going to be learning about some of the basic field marks that we can start to hone in on to help us become better, more confident birders, and then take a look at some of the birds that we're apt to see in our backyards at our feeders. We're going to also take a look at some of the feeding strategies that we might deploy based on what birds we might want to attract or in some cases which we may want to deter from our feeders. Um, and lastly, I'm really going to um, introduce some of you, maybe some of you already may be doing this, but um, highlight a community science project by the name of Project Feeder Watch, which um, really seeks to engage everyday folks in observing birds and then submitting their data for conservation. In the last 10 minutes or so, I hope to leave it open for Q&A for all of you to submit your questions at that time. Now I'm going to go ahead and disable my camera so that you all can focus on the beautiful slides I have for you, but I'll turn my camera back on at the conclusion of today's presentation for Q&A. All right. So let's go ahead and dive in everybody. What does it mean for a bird to be resident and what does it mean for them to be a migratory species? Well, when we look at the bird on the right-hand side of the slide, our black-capped chickadee, that bird is a resident here in the state of Connecticut, meaning that we are able to see the species throughout the entirety of the year, regardless of the season, right? It doesn't matter if it's spring, fall, winter, or summer, we are seeing the black-capped chickadee here in Northwestern Connecticut. Now, does that mean that we're seeing the same black-capped chickadees at our feeders as we're maybe seeing breeding in our backyards? We can't really be sure of that unless we banned them. But again, we're able to see this particular species year round in the state of Connecticut. That's not necessarily the case for our tree swallows here on the left-hand side of the slide. We don't ever see these birds here in Northwestern Connecticut because of them being what we call obligate insectivores, meaning that they have evolved to specifically consume insects, which of course they're not able to find during the winter months here. So they have to migrate south to be able to find um, that food supply. And they happen to go pretty far south as a long distance migrant. When we're talking about migrants, if we wanted to break it down just a little bit more, um, we could think of them almost as being uh, similarly how we describe runners in a track and field event. We have some short distance, some middle distance, and some long distance migrants. So when we take a look at the range maps of both of these species side by side, we can really see the difference in the movements that these birds are making as a migrant species versus a resident species. So again, looking at our tree swallows, we can see that they're moving um, in a variety of different places throughout their ranges, right? We see them orange um, breeding in the upper half of the US. We can see them moving through the middle part of the country and then eventually winding up in the tropics of Central America, again, where those abundant insect populations are. Right, unlike the black cap chickadee, we see just one color there, right? We see just our purple that's present on our range map, telling us that they're not just a resident in the state of Connecticut, but they're in fact a resident throughout the entirety of their range in the US and in Canada. So then it bears the question, well, can birds be both migrants and residents? And the answer, hopefully not to confuse you terribly, is yes. And the American robin is a really great example of that very phenomenon. 
It just all depends on where the bird is located within its range. So as we do have American robins that are breeding up in the northern parts of Canada, um, they do make migrations where they end up in states like Connecticut to spend the winter months, right? But that's not always the case. We do consider the American robin to be a resident species here in northwestern Connecticut because again, like our black capped chickadee, we see them um, here throughout the year regardless of what season it is. And they do have a couple of tricks up their sleeve to be able to survive the cold temperatures if they are indeed a resident. Um, so first and foremost, these birds are highly adaptable and are able to in fact switch up their diets depending on the season. So instead of feasting on those earthworms and the ground is nice and soft during the spring and the summer, these birds are dining pretty much exclusively on berries and shrubs that produce berries like our American holly featured in this photo here, right? So taking advantage of a completely different food source depending on the season. Um, in addition, in the winter months, these birds are oftentimes growing an additional layer of those downy feathers, right? The, the downy feathers sit right against the bird's skin and are those feathers that help to trap air against the bird's body to keep them warm, right? And last but not least, these birds, you're oftentimes seeing them um, form into these really large, robust winter flocks involving hundreds, if sometimes not thousands of birds in these flocks. And that really helps them do a couple of things. It helps have a lot of eyes on potential predators like hawks, but it also helps them potentially navigate additional food sources too. Uh, when I was doing my CBC route, my Christmas bird count route here um, near the Sharon Audubon Center, I stumbled upon a flock of probably about a hundred robins just a few miles away that happened to be pecking on the flesh of crab apples that were still hanging on a couple of trees here in a little orchard. So again, maybe you guys are seeing these large flocks of robins in the area too, as that's one of the adaptations they deploy um, when they are a resident here. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into a little bit of identifying our bird species in our backyards and start thinking about what some of these specific characteristics are that can help us tell birds apart from one another. <laughs> now I give you this visual here not to intimidate you, but hopefully to inspire you, if you're a new birder especially, to start by learning the birds' families. Right? I find that this can be a much more encouraging strategy than just kind of cold looking up birds in a field guide. That can oftentimes leave us very stressed out and very discouraged because there are over 10,000 bird species in the world and there are just around 440 in the state of Connecticut and just short of 500 in the state of New York, right? So that's a lot of birds to be flipping through in a guidebook looking for. Um, so when again, when we start at the family level and we begin becoming familiar with family groups like owls or wading birds or ducks, um, birds like that, we can then have a more productive launching point than to start identifying the bird we saw in our backyard. Um, so this visual that I have in my slide is actually um, a real poster that you can buy on the internet should you wish it to grace the walls in your home. <laughs> it can make a really beautiful um, statement piece, but it also, again, is a very valuable learning tool and help us, helping us to become more familiar with those bird families. Again, especially for a new uh, birder and we're looking for a starting point to start learning our bird species. So then once we become a little bit more comfortable with these different families of birds, we might start to learn which field marks we should start paying attention to when we're identifying our birds, right? So these six that I have on the screen are six really valuable field marks that tell us a lot, not only about what the bird looks like, but what birds are doing in their natural environments. So when we look at the first one, the plumage, which is just a fancy way of saying the feathers on a bird, right? Birds are oftentimes really colorful, but not just are they colorful, they're often really colorful in distinctive ways. So when we look at distinctive colorations or markings on our birds, um, that can really help us pull apart species that oftentimes look really similar and are oftentimes in the same family. So looking at our cedar waxwing here in my slide, it has a beautiful black mask on the face that's distinct. It has a really lovely warm palette of colors across most of its body, and it has this orange or yellow tail tip at the end, in addition, of course, to the namesake wax-like looking red droplets of color on its secondary feathers on the wings, right? In addition to color, we might also hone in on to special groups of feathers too. So on this bird's head, we have a crest, which is not inherent to every bird species, right? So this could be, again, another special grouping of feathers that we might pay attention to when we're looking at this bird. 
when we're looking at the size of a bird and we're describing it to somebody, we're not talking about dimensions. We're not giving inches or feet or anything like that, of course. We're comparing those bird sizes to something that's familiar to us. So oftentimes that can be another bird that we know out in the world, right? That could be a crow, that could be a jay, a robin, a chickadee, anything like that that helps give somebody else a relative idea of the size. Um, but that could also be um, an inanimate object too. There's no shame in that whatsoever. If you are trying to tell somebody about a bird or trying to remember it yourself and you're thinking, okay, this looks like a softball size, basketball size, maybe you're looking at a wren and you're trying to tell somebody, hey, I think this is about ping pong ball size. <laughs> There's no shame in that. And actually I deploy this tactic a lot when people are calling our Audubon Center and trying to tell us about injured or orphaned birds that they find. Because we do have a wildlife rehabilitation clinic at our Audubon Center, we get a ton of calls in the summer, particularly about fledglings that people are confused about, right? They're wondering why these birds are on the ground and what they can do to help them. So if they give me a size of a bird and they don't know the species and say, hey, I think this is maybe about blue jay size, I know to prep a carrier about that size instead of prepping something for like a red-tailed hawk, for example. So that can be really helpful for me on the phone. When we're talking about the structure of our birds, we're really just talking about the general shape of the bird. Are, is it long and slender? Is it kind of squat and compact? Does it have short rounded wings or kind of long tapered ones? You know, does it have a robust bill or a little tiny one? Body markings like that, that essentially give us an idea of what the shape of the animal is. And of course, behavior can be really telling as to what a species of bird is or even the general family of birds. Right, if we look at the behavior of a cedar waxwing, going back to the species, for example, uh, we know that in the wintertime, these birds are seen in small flocks, right? Oftentimes associated with places that have good cover. I watched them hover above a bird feeder on my Christmas bird count, for example, and they would not leave this part of the oak tree that still had a cluster of leaves that were clinging to it. They really wanted to be underneath that good cover in the wintertime. Right, so behavior might, might be something as simple as flocking up in the wintertime, like the species of bird, or it could involve courtship behaviors, which are very, very diverse, of course, around the world when it comes to birds um, and other such behaviors. Where our birds are living is often a really key indicator in telling us either what it is or what it isn't. Some bird species are very widely adapted to being able to occupy deserts and forests and wetlands and all sorts of other environments, while other bird species are very limited in the habitats that they can occupy, right? So knowing the habitat where a bird is residing can often be important in, in telling us more about that particular bird. And last, and of course, but not least, is the song, right? Song can sometimes be the only field mark that we really need to rely on when telling us what a bird is out in the wild. And field researchers use this tactic often when they are surveying, especially in the spring and summer months for birds. They will only be listening for the song as a clue to what the bird species is. And that's all they have to know because that song um, is very distinctive between species. All right, so now I'm gonna allow you guys to practice this a little bit and utilizing these field marks to give us a better understanding of the bird in front of us. The bird in front of us is probably a very familiar feeder resident for most of you here in Northwestern Connecticut and in other parts of the state and country because this bird's range is pretty wide. Um, but let's take a look at some of these. So the plumage, right? Pretty straightforward on this bird, really consistently red throughout and the males blaring are bearing, excuse me, this really distinctive black face mask in addition to the, that crest on the top of the head, that special grouping of feathers. But now I'm gonna ask you guys, I want you to tell me in the chat box how you would describe the size of this bird, either comparing it to a similarly sized bird or your favorite inanimate object that you think it most closely resembles. And let's see what you guys come up with. Size of a robin, very good. Yeah, robin is one of my favorite birds to reference when people are trying to get a good understanding of a size. Like I said, when they're finding birds out in the wild. Tennis ball, good. Blue jay size, yeah, very good. Thrush, good, if we're going out a little bit more general. Yeah, good, so getting some blue jays, getting some robins, those are really good sizes to be able to compare this bird to. Um, the structure, if we're looking at the structure of this bird, we might notice again that it has this crest on top of its head, in addition to a nice long tail. 
paired up with this pretty round little body, right? But what about the behavior? Now I want you guys to tell me about a behavior that you see the Northern Cardinal exercising, um, either in winter or in other parts of the year. What's something striking to you about this particular field mark with a Cardinal? Shy, yeah, very good. Thanks, Lloyd, for that. Yeah, you tend to associate these birds with, um, with cover, right? With thickets or with brushy stuff on the outer edge of a forest. Ground feeder, very good. Those of you guys who are feeding your birds right now, you notice that they are feeding on the ground predominantly. That doesn't mean that they won't feed on another type of feeder, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, but they do really like to feed on the ground. Yeah, very good. Good, good, good. Tends to feed early or late in the day. I liked that one. I didn't get to see who submitted it, but yes, they are oftentimes early feeders and they are just as, just as often late to leave the feeding scene at the end of the day. Very good. So habitat, you guys kind of told me a little bit about this already, but these guys tend to be associated with cover. That could be native or non-native. They may be hiding out in a privet hedge, which is non-native, or they might be hiding out in some native thickets that you guys have, or clusters of vines like poison ivy that they're hiding out behind, right? We tend to associate these birds with cover, um, but we know that these birds can inhabit all sorts of environments from urban to suburban um, to more wild habitats like we have in, in Northwestern Connecticut here. And last but not least, the song and the call. So both of those are pretty distinctive with the cardinal and now they're going to be issuing their call. So if you do have a pair at your feeder, you might often hear them issuing these little chips between the pair to let one another know where they are. All right, very good, you guys. Thank you for all that input. So if we zoom in just one more level on our plumage, we can look at some basic feather groups to give us a better understanding of where to look on a bird's body when we're trying to pick out some of these physical field marks, again, related to feathers, right? So don't worry, I'm not gonna have you guys memorize all these and give you a quiz at the end of the presentation. So don't worry about that. But the ones that I have circled here are again, um, the spots on the bird's body where we tend to see our more distinctive field markings at the top of the head, on the crown, on the breast and the belly, right? When we think of our American robin, one of the first birds that many of us learn, we know that it has that really bright red, orange breast and belly, right? The tail and the undertail coverts, you may not think so, but there are oftentimes distinctive markings that are displayed in both those parts. Sometimes that undertail covert is just an entire bright color, brighter than the rest of its body that gives that species away. Um, and other times we might find more distinctive markings on the nape or the back of the neck as well. So again, just a few spots that we might pay extra special attention to. Because remember, when we're, I'm sure we can all relate to this, when we've been out in the wild, we're looking at birds, they don't often award us very long glances, right? They've got things to do and they're a prey animal, many of them. So they're trying to hide a lot of the time and not be super conspicuous. So if we only get fleeting glances of these birds and we try to focus our attention on some of these circled areas regarding their feathers, um, we might have a better opportunity of making a more confident identification afterwards. All righty, so let's get into a couple of our species that we might be seeing in our feeders now. Da -da -da -da. Notice that I don't have the names displayed yet. We're gonna hone in on a couple of these feather groups and go through and compare and contrast. And then I want you guys just in a second to tell me what these species are. Both of them are a member of the sparrow family, right? So we're just gonna say that for the time being. The bird on the right-hand side, if we take a look at its crown compared to the bird on the left-hand side, we can see that there are markings there, right? But they are very different markings as far as color goes. The breast on these birds isn't particularly noticeable on the bird on the left, but with the bird on the right, we see this kind of smudging effect there, right? And this is found both on the male and the female. So this particular species is very similar in appearance to another member of its family. So, so long as I see that smudge on the breast, I know that it is that species and not the other one that looks very similar to it. And I'll tell you what that is in just a second. The belly isn't particularly standout-ish on either of these birds with any particularly noticeable markings. But if we look at the tail at the bird on the right-hand side, we might notice that it is long and slender compared to the smallish size of the body. And that's actually a notable field mark for this particular bird because members of its family also bear small bodies with long slender tails. And that family is Spizella, if that's helpful for anybody or gives anything away, right? Small bodies with these long slender tails in that family. All right, now 
I want you guys to tell me what you think or what you know these birds to be. Let's start on the right hand side. Go ahead and tell me in the chat what our bird is on the right hand side. All right. Yeah, very good. Yeah, great. We've got some good answers coming in and some really good guesses too. So yeah, quite a few of you are saying really good guesses, folks. Yes, and somebody said the one that looks really similar to this one. So I'm excited to cover that. This is our American tree sparrow. And it does look very similar to the chipping sparrow, which again, I'm glad somebody put. Those are two members of the same family, Spizella, those small bodies and long slender tails. But the chipping sparrow, for one, does not have that smudged breast like the American tree sparrow does. And our chipping sparrows are actually migratory. So they're hanging out right now in the balmy temps of the southeastern United States spending the winter, right? Our American tree sparrows, contrarily, are also a migratory species, but they are breeding way up on the edge of the tundra in northern Canada and Alaska. So it's a, really a treat for us to be able to get them um, so far south here during the winter time. The bird on the left-hand side, go ahead and tell me what you know this bird to be. Yeah, we have a field mark that gives this bird away for those who know it. This is our white-throated sparrow, right? My arrow has given us a little hint there to focus in on that white throat, which is present in both the male and female of the species, in addition to that multicolored crown. So our white-throated sparrow, similarly, um, comes down to us from Canada in pretty significant numbers and hangs out with us here during the winter time. My slide was a little lagging there, sorry folks. All right, moving on, we're still gonna stick with the sparrow family here. This is one of my personal favorites and one of the more adorable members of this family in my humble opinion. We have our dark guy Junko here, who is uh, both a resident here in the state of Connecticut, but is also considered to be a medium distance migrant in other parts of its range in Canada, for example. Um, so as a resident bird in Connecticut, we have this bird breeding at higher altitudes during the spring and the summer months. So we're really only apt to find them in places like Great Mountain Forest or in the hills of Kent, for example. Um, breeding populations have been found in both of those areas. Um, but again, we tend to get these birds in pretty large numbers because of the birds that are migrating down to us from Canada. What I love about this sparrow here is that there really isn't anything else that looks very similar to it. Right, we have our tufted titmouse that kind of sort of looks like it, but our dark, -eyed, our dark eyed junco is lacking that crest on top of the head and the colors are more dichotomous too. It's kind of split in half with that gray on the top half of its body and this nice crisp white on the underbelly extending all the way to the tail. And what I love about this bird too is even if I don't get a good look at it at a feeder, if I see it flying away from me and I know to focus in on these outer tail feathers, I know that it's a dark eyed junco that I'm looking at because no other bird has these outer retrices or tail feathers, both on the top and on the bottom that I can look at, right, when I deem this bird flying away from the feeder. This bird often does, just like other sparrow species, does tolerate a variety of species at the feeder, and so you oftentimes seeing them associate with other sparrow species like the American tree sparrow and the white-throated sparrow, in addition to other ground feeding birds at bird feeders. No other bird really, in my opinion, goes through such a drastic transformation in plumage at our bird feeders than does the American goldfinch. We can see this very studly male on the right hand side and really lustrous, beautiful breeding plumage with a nice black cap at the top of the head, um, but looking rather drab, still quite lovely, but very drab in comparison here in the left hand photo. Um, Two features that I really like to focus in on when talking about plumage and identifying this bird at a feeder because, as we'll see in a couple of slides um, here in a minute, it does look really similar to another bird that might visit our feeders this winter. But if we look at again at the American goldfinch, we can see that it has these black, black wings with these really bold, thick white wing bars. So that's one um, field mark that we can hone in relative to the feathers that might help us more confidently identify this bird. In addition, to the consistent dull yellow wash that's present along the underside of the bird. My arrow is there to indicate that there isn't any streaking on the side of the bird, like we're gonna see 
on another member of this family that does bear a lot of streaking on the side of its body, right? All right, now we're really getting into the good stuff. So these two birds are found at our feeders here in Northwestern Connecticut in fair abundance, and they look virtually identical, right? But there are a couple of field marks that I'm gonna teach you guys to hone in on so that you can more confidently tell these birds apart if you are oftentimes confused like I was for a long time about differentiating between these bird species. So if we first take a look at the female purple finch, for example, we can see my arrow is pointing to this white eyebrow or supercilium, if we wanna be really technical, <laughs> that's very bold and visible, right? And not at all present on the female house finch. Instead on that bird species, we just see a lot of the streaking that we see throughout the rest of the body, right? So again, really honing in on this thick visible eyebrow for the purple finch female. Once you see that, you can feel very confident that it's a purple finch and not a house finch. Um, size isn't super reliable in telling these two species apart because the purple finch is only slightly larger by about less than an inch. So again, looking at that eyebrow on the female. And for the male, we can see that both males of these species have some red on the bodies, right? But our, our male purple finch is completely dipped in this rosy red coloration from the tip of its bill or the base of its bill rather all the way to the tip of its tail, right? Whereas we look at the male house finch and we see this red only as accents here on the crown and on the breast, a little bit on the belly and on a little patch on its rump on the back, right? So it may take some practice for you seeing these birds side by side to be able to tell which is which, but again, the male of the purple finch is going to display that rosy color much more consistently throughout the body. All right, oh my goodness. So 2020 brought us a lot of stress, um, a lot of heartache. Just 2020 was a very, very busy year for many of us. Um, but one good thing that did come out of 2020 was an eruptive finch year, which was absolutely fantastic. So what does it mean when we're talking about an eruption? What that means essentially um, has to do with, um, with the mast cycles that trees are involved in in the boreal forest where these birds are breeding, right? So trees develop this evolutionary strategy, we think to avoid squirrels eating so many of their nuts that new trees don't grow up, is that they produce these mast or these nuts on cycles, right? So it's not every year they're pumping out lots of acorns. One year might be a shortage, another year might be a good mast year. So on lower producing mast years, these finches are flying south into places like New England and in Northwestern Connecticut to take advantage of other more reliable food sources. And 2020 wasn't just a good eruption year. It was what scientists are referring to as a, um, as a super year for these eruptive species, right? Because we had evening gross beaks here on the left-hand side. We had pine siskins and we had common red poles coming to our feeders. Unfortunately, I only saw about five pine siskins. I didn't see any red poles or any evening gross beaks and I felt like everybody else was seeing them. So hopefully you guys got to see some. So if you did see some, go ahead and let us know in the chat if you were able to see any of these eruptive winter finches, right? Because it's not every year that they're coming down. It really depends just on the crop cycles or on the mass cycles rather up in the boreal forest where they breed. Um, one thing you guys can tune into if you're really interested in tracking winter finch populations is something called the winter finch forecast, um, which is run by a scientist by the name of Tyler Hoare um, and uses these mass production years to predict the movements of these finches throughout the year. Um, so again, if that's something you're interested in, um, you might again tune into winter finch forecast. Last but not least, before I forget, I have my little blue arrow here to remind me um, this pine siskin looks really similar to our American goldfinch in size and in general coloration, but notice the streaking on the side of the body. When you see a lot of streaks like that and a similar sized and color bird to our American goldfinch, that's more likely to be our pine siskin. And in addition, siskins really like to operate in flocks, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 or more birds in a flock typically at a feeder. So that could be something you also look for in addition to those streaks on the body. All right, so moving in now, kind of moving away from our songbirds and moving into some woodpecker identification. Uh, so again, I don't have the names up here for you guys because I'm gonna see how much you know about telling apart, again, two very similar looking woodpecker species. And you're apt to see both of these woodpecker species at your feeder this winter. 
Um, the one on the left, you can see where my arrow is pointing, tends to have a much thicker cluster of a grouping of feathers known as rictal bristles. Um, we know that rictal bristles can serve all sorts of functions, at least we hypothesize that they serve certain functions in certain groups of birds, like in um, uh, aerial insectivores, like, um, uh, like uh, flycatchers, for example. Um, they help keep debris out of the bird's eyes, we think, when they're sallying um, with snowy owls. They help the mother bird to be able to detect the mouths of the, of the nestlings that she's feeding. And so for woodpeckers, we suspect that they help keep debris and flying wood chips out of the bird's face as they're hammering into the wood, right? So we see this cluster much more prevalent in my bird on the left than on the bird on the right, right? So that might be a field mark that you guys tune into if you're looking at this woodpecker and are saying, ah, I don't really know which one this is because again, they look very similar. If we look over at my bird on the right hand side, we can see that the bill is just larger in general and more robust, right? Not only that, but it really just has only this tiny little tuft of the rictal bristles, nothing compared to the little kind of shredded cotton ball amount that my bird on the left hand side does. Size does play um, a factor in telling these two birds apart as the one on the right is considerably larger than the one on the left. However, you really don't get to experience this until you see them out in the wild enough and feel confident in knowing the size difference, right? So I like to talk about these other field marks in addition when telling these two species apart. Okay, so now it's your time to shine, folks. Which species is my bird on the left-hand side? What do you think? Is it a downy or a hairy woodpecker? Oh, you guys are on fire. All right, I think you guys already knew all this. Excellent, very good. Yes, so Downy is on the left, very good. And somebody even indicated that we know it's a male because of this red marking here on the back of the head. And my bird on the right is a hairy woodpecker. Again, we know it's a male because of this red marking here um, at the back of the head that would not be present if the bird was female. Yeah, very good, everybody, thank you. So Downy on the left, hairy on the right. All right, really quickly, two other species that you might see at your feeder. The red-bellied is one you are apt to see much more frequently at your feeder than the yellow-bellied sapsucker. The yellow-bellied sapsucker, curiously enough, is a migratory species of woodpecker. And so they, uh, many of them are spending a balmy winter in the southeastern United States currently. Um, but we tend to actually see that females are more likely than males to migrate all the way to Central America. I don't think we know exactly why that is currently, but we tend to find ratios of three to one, female to male in the Central American wintering grounds for this particular species. So I'm not ruling it out entirely as we do see a yellow-bellied sapsucker here on the feeder, but I have seen a few this winter and know that they will occasionally come to feeders. So you might look out for that one. The red-bellied woodpecker, however, is more apt to be seen at your feeders and it is a dominant species. If you have a red belly woodpecker at your feeder, you have probably seen their boss attitude on full display with them kind of bustling out of the birds that are on the feeder and really not moving away when other birds are there. I think the only thing that might scare them away is multiple crows landing or multiple blue jays, excuse me, landing on the feeder at the same time. Um, again, they tend to be a pretty dominant species and will take not just peanuts and peanut hearts, um, but it'll even take black oil sunflower seeds if it's out for them and no other options are available. Um, just a note, these guys, um, we didn't tend to see them as frequently about 20 years ago. Um, so this is an example of a bird whose range is expanding and we're seeing them more and more here in Northwestern Connecticut. So again, you're, you're quite likely to see them in your backyards and at your feeder. So now we're talking about bird ID, we're getting more familiar with species in our backyard. So let's talk about how to supplement them during the winter months. We get all kinds of questions here at the Audubon Center about feeding birds. And so I wanna address just a couple of them before I move on to which seeds can really bring in certain species of birds. Uh, the first question we get here is, am I doing the birds harm by feeding them in the winter? And I would say to that, no. Do we need to feed birds here in the Northwest corner of Connecticut for them to be able to survive the winter? Would also be a no, but it can again help supplement them. Um, I say, no, we don't need to be feeding them here in this part of the country because our habitat is really high quality first and foremost, 
right? We have good habitat that um, provides a lot of food in the way of seeds and fruits for our resident birds and the migrants that come down to us from more Northern territories. So they have an ample food supply to take advantage of. Our birds second are also equipped with a variety of adaptations like we talked about a little bit early in the presentation, um, which do in addition help them to survive these cold long winter days and nights. Right. If I were to be talking about, though, a more suburban or urban environment that maybe had fragmented habitat or more degraded habitat, I would place a higher importance on feeding birds during the winter because they probably or they might not have as have as um, equal access to really good habitat with ample food supply. Alrighty. So when talking about certain kinds of bird seed, um, mm -hmm. oftentimes people are asking, you know, what is the seed I can offer that attracts the greatest diversity of birds? And for me, that's the black oil sunflower seed. This seed is really high in energy, first and foremost, right? Giving birds a lot of important calories for them to be able to keep shivering and keeping themselves warm during the nighttime. Um, but in addition, they have a really thin hull. And so they're really easy to crack open for a variety of different bird bill shapes and sizes. So your, you know, your Northern Cardinal with a really big robust bill can crack these babies open, but so can your black capped chickadees, right? So can your really small songbirds. Um, so again, they facilitate a wide variety of different bill shapes and sizes. If you don't feel like offering your birds some additional enrichment by making them forcibly crack open the seeds, you can make it really easy and fun for them and just feed them the whole sunflower kernels with no shells surrounding them. Again, making that pretty widely available and pretty easy for them to take advantage of. Um, just be prepared to pay a little bit more for that um, because of the process of removing that hull. Safflower seed is um, not so much fun to talk about in terms of what birds it attracts, but more so about what birds it deters from feeding at your feeder. So for example, if you don't want blackbirds, European starlings or grackles bothering your other feeder birds at your feeders because they do tend to be bullies and they can drain a feeder in a matter of hours, you might consider mixing in some safflower seeds or only offering safflower exclusively at your feeder. Why? Well, Safflower tends to taste bitter to blackbirds, we found, but it also has this irregular shape too, which is really difficult for those birds to crack open, if not impossible for birds like European starlings, right? So we'll talk about a couple of other strategies if they come up in the Q&A about deterring those birds, but offering safflower can be one of them, right, to keep those birds out. Other things you might consider adding or buying a mix that it contains are peanuts and peanut hearts, which are really rich in fat and protein for birds. Um, dried fruits like raisins or cranberries, cherries, um, and a variety of other seeds too, like pumpkin seeds and white millet. Millet is really a favorite of sparrow species. And so if you feed exclusively millet on the ground or you include it in a mix and put it on the ground for sparrows, they will really love that. All right, so oftentimes too, people ask us about um, thistle and niger seed. So um, our, our finches, like our American goldfinch, are feeding on thistle during, during the summer months when it's available. But during the winter, um, what we're actually getting is niger, and that's being sold in bird stores as a sort of thistle substitute. It's really similar, but it in fact is imported all the way from Ethiopia, um, from a specific, from the niger plant, actually. Um, and so a little bit different than thistle, but it still is really, really beloved by these small finch species like the American goldfinch, like pine siskins and red poles too will really like it. You can offer them in very specific feeders that cater to thistle or, or excuse me, to niger seed. Because this seed is so tiny, you have to have special feeder ports that are able to hold it so that it's just not constantly falling out. So you might inquire at the place where you buy your bird feeder accoutrements and, and feeder supplies and such about specific niger seed feeders for these smaller finch species. You can also offer it in a sock too. I wouldn't recommend offering the sock during the winter because of all the excess precipitation and moisture that's available that can cause you know, nasty bacterial and fungal growths inside of the thistle sock. Um, but this is something that can be really fun to feed your finches with in the summer months. Just so long as you're making sure to check on it every couple of days and bring it inside the house when um, rain is pending. All right, so suet can also be something that we offer our birds, and it's not just for woodpeckers. I have woodpeckers here feasting on suet and peanut butter um, in my photos, but all kinds of birds love to munch on suet, as I'm sure you guys have noticed who feed birds, right? Black-capped chickadees, tufted titmice, white-breasted nuthatches, those guys will all dine on suet if it is readily available. 
Um, and if you guys are curious, I'd be happy to answer questions about how you can deter species like European starlings from getting into the suet and depleting it too. Uh, I'll just save that to the end if anybody brings it up in Q&A. The only other thing I'll mention about suet is, um, which is made from beef kidney fat, in case anybody was wondering and was wanting to make their own. Um, when people do purchase it from the store, just like seed, we really encourage people to spend the few extra dollars to buy high quality bird seed from vendors like Wild Birds Unlimited, from your local Audubon store, um, or from other local places like the Fat Robin, which I've been made aware of in Hamden, Connecticut. Right? So spending the, a little bit of extra money to get high quality seed because in some really basic mixes at places like grocery stores, oftentimes there can be additional dyes and um, other additional preservatives and things like that that are put into the mixes that may not be so great for our birds. Uh, with dyes, I see that often in suet cakes in grocery stores and things. Sometimes they'll dye the seeds really visible colors like blues and pinks. Um, and to be honest, we don't really know what kind of effect that has on birds yet. The research just isn't there yet. Um, but to be on the safe side, we always recommend that people, again, um, buy those without any artificial dyes and from their local Audubon store, Wild Birds Unlimited, or another trusted bird seed supplier. Yeah, so let's talk about some feeders here for a little bit. Um, there are all sorts of feeder types and models out there. Um, so let's take a look at just a few of them here. We have our two feeder on the far left hand side and this feeder is great because it can facilitate a wide variety of your little guys, right? You can have your black capped chickadees there, you can have your house finches and your titmice and all of your small songbird species there and you have this nice tube with a protective cover that keeps that seed nice and dry for at least a couple of days, right? Kind of depends on what your feather traffic is like, if you have a lot of birds coming in and munching on seeds. Um, but if you don't, you can kind of gauge that and then you can refill it accordingly. But again, the real benefit there is that the seed stays dry and you can accommodate a lot of small guys at the same time. If you're wanting to still keep your seed dry and have a roof over the top, but accommodate some larger birds at the feeder, the hopper feeder is the option for you as you can feed your small guys there, but it's spacious enough to allow your larger feeder players there, like your morning doves, your jays, um, and your larger finch species, right? Like your, um, your gross beaks and such. So the hopper feeder again, facilitates your larger birds being able to get up there and feed. Um, the option for accommodating the most amount of different birds at the same time is your tray or your platform feeder up there in the right hand corner. However, uh, you can't quite see it because the picture is kind of cut off, but this oftentimes does not have a roof. And if you do want to put a roof or a cover over the top, you have to install that separately. So the real risk with having your platform feeder is that um, you don't have great drainage and you have the potential for excess moisture to build up in there and create some nasty kind of fungal stuff and bacterial stuff that's going on in there. Right. So um, that's just something to be aware of. You just have to really stay on top of the maintenance if you do have a tray or a platform feeder. They can be a delight, on the other hand, to see lots of different kinds of birds feeding at the same time. Again, so long as we stay up on the maintenance. Now, last but not least, our window feeder might seem really counterintuitive, right? You're thinking, why in the world would I attract birds to my glass when about 100 million birds die every year from glass collisions? Yes, you heard that right, 100 million. It's a big issue that we're really trying to work out and trying to prevent. However, here is the rule when it comes to bird feeders near windows. You either want to place it within three feet of your window, like you see our window feeder here right up against the glass of the window, or you want it more than 30 feet away of the window. And here's why. When our birds get startled and they're flying off the feeder, when they're, let's say, within only a couple of feet of a feeder, they really don't have time or distance enough to build up enough momentum to really cause long lasting head trauma if they collide into a glass pane, right? But if we put that feeder 10 feet away, that bird has substantially more distance and time to build up momentum to really do some damage, if not cause death when it collides with a glass pane. Um, and so we do get calls a lot here at our center in our wildlife rehabilitation clinic about bird glass collisions. Um, so again, um, either putting it within three feet or more than 30 feet, because at 30 feet, when those birds get startled, they have a lot of other places to go. They're not gonna be as tempted to collide right into that glass pane when they get scared, right? Yeah. So. Again, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer questions about decals and bird safe glass if you have them at the end of the presentation because those are some other things we can deploy to help prevent birds from colliding into glass. 
But if you do opt to go for a window feeder, you can see there's not a ton of space to accommodate lots of birds at the feeder, but it can award you some really beautiful, charming up close views of the birds that are there. And so when we're setting up our sort of dream feeder system, right, and we have a really long shepherd's pole with various hooks and maybe many of these in our yards, um, we might begin to think about where birds are foraging in their wild habitat and how we might accommodate those behaviors in our feeder setup itself, right? So for feeding on the ground, we can think of our sparrows, right? The dark-eyed jungle and the white-throated sparrow that we met, in addition to our morning dove, whom I mentioned are oftentimes feeding together and associating together on the ground. However, we might put some sort of feeder apparatus at the middle of our pole to accommodate these mid-level shrub foragers like our northern cardinal or our finch species, right? Many of you notice that cardinals are feeding on the ground and they do oftentimes, but they also will take advantage of these mid-level feeder apparatuses. Finally, we might think about accommodating these other birds that tend to forage higher up in the canopy in their wild environments. Right, either some tube feeders or a suet feeder or other things that are up at the top for them. So again, just taking into consideration their wild behaviors. All right, so we get a lot of questions to you about bears and feeders. So let's talk about that here for a minute. This bear is sitting fat and pretty happy right there, really not having to do pretty much any work at all to get the <laughs> seed from this particular feeder. This was actually taken from Miles Wildlife Sanctuary, one of the properties that we managed um, just recently. So, well, not too terribly recently, but within the past couple of years, so kind of funny. So with bears, um, we really tend to see bears raiding feeders when we have mild winters, right? So when we have temperatures that for an extended periods of time are above freezing and we have little snowfall. Um, with those temperatures not dipping below freezing for prolonged periods of time, that's really not encouraging bears to go in um, to this resting state during the winter time, right? They're not as encouraged to remain in their dens. Um, and then with limited snow cover, those bears are able to find food fairly well. Again, if the temperature remains above freezing for prolonged periods of time, right? They don't have to dig too deep in the snow and it's not as challenging for them to navigate um, really deep snow as they're moving about their environments. Um, so those two things we see where bears are pretty active. So in the past couple of winters, they've been relatively mild for this region. Um, so I've been telling people um, usually to go ahead and bring their feeders in um, in evening time and then bring them out uh, around like late morning the next day. Um, since bears are crepuscular, active predominantly um, during the dawn and during the dusk, um, they're not as apt to be raiding your bird feeder during the middle, after, uh, the middle of the afternoon. It's not completely impossible, but it's not as likely as them patrolling you know, early in the morning or late in the afternoon. We've all experienced those pesky squirrels getting into our feeders without a doubt. And so I am here to give you some alternatives to help deter those squirrels from getting in your feeders. If you are like me and you are feeding the birds, you are only feeding the birds and you are not also feeding the squirrels. If you do feed the squirrels, that's completely fine. That is entirely up to you, of course. But I think that many of us, when we're feeding the birds, we are focusing on feeding the birds and nothing else. So first and foremost, we can think about installing a squirrel baffle and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and designs nowadays, again, to really help prevent our birds, or our birds, excuse me, our squirrels from climbing up the pole and getting into our feeders, right? So we can see one design here, that's a predator guard that really just prevents the squirrel from climbing higher. And here, I really like this model where it prevents the squirrel from being able to grasp on to that baffle and lift itself up and then continue climbing the pole, right? So both these have been proven to be very effective. This, you might put a guard on the top of your feeder to prevent squirrels from climbing down on a nearby tree. But in addition, if you do have a lot of trees in your yard and you're placing your feeder next to a tree, which we do recommend to an extent because it is a, a best practice to place your feeder near cover where your birds have access to somewhere to go in case a predator is in the area and they need somewhere to hide you might wanna consider installing your feeder at least 10 feet away from nearby trees or shrubs to prevent those squirrels from jumping, right? If you guys have not placed them about 10 feet away, you have seen these squirrels jump, I'm sure. They can really leap. So again, placing them at least 10 feet away from nearby trees or shrubs. And then maybe additionally, considering placing these types of guards on the feeder to keep them off. An additional deterrent might be just a cage that you place around some of these tube feeders. 
And all of these things you guys can find at your trusted bird store. Uh, we do have several of these models in addition to all sorts of feeder um, supplies and seed at our Audubon store too, should you have any questions. So feel free to give me a call at any point after this, um, should you need some more info on any of this, uh, any of this material. All right, here is the real ticket, you guys. If you have had chronic squirrel issues for years and years and have just been pulling your hair out about what to do about it, Squirrel Buster is here to save the day. This feeder type is made by a company called Brome and it is quite ingenious. Here is how it works. A squirrel will try to come down into the feeder and when it does, it'll get onto this perching platform where these birds are seated. But because of the squirrel's weight, what it does is it pushes this platform down. And as that pushes down, a bar raises up inside of these feeder ports and just prevents a blockage from those. So squirrels cannot get to that seed inside. They can't reach their little paws in and grab any seed to eat. So yeah, it's pretty ingenious. And you can see that there are a couple of different models that can be deployed here. Again, as a really ingenious way to keep squirrels out of those feeders. Just do be prepared to spend a little bit more though on these feeders than you might otherwise would. Um, they run anywhere from 35 to just over 50 bucks for these. So again, it's an investment, but if you have been having chronic squirrel problems and nothing else has worked, this might be something that you guys try. Alrighty, so in addition to squirrels, we might not like to see squirrels in our yards taking advantage of our bird seed. And similarly, we might also not like to see hawks in our yard taking advantage of our feeder birds. But folks, um, I hate to tell you if you view hawks in a negative light, but these guys have to eat too at the end of the day. And curiously, Feeder Watch actually told us from years and years of data that Cooper's hawks, like the bird we see in this photo, they are actually spending more and more time um, here in the winter in places like New England, as opposed to migrating south to Mexico like they normally would, because we think they have learned that there are large clusters of feeder birds present at feeders that they can take advantage of. Um, this hawk belongs to the group of hawks known as occipiters, and they are built for speed and agility. They are built to predate on birds that are zipping through the trees of the forest. So they have no problem um, crashing down on birds at feeders and taking advantage of that. So again, um, I hope that you don't see that in a negative light, but instead see that as a positive predator prey interaction within a healthy, robust ecosystem. Alrighty, so really quick here, just a little bit about feeder maintenance because this is important, just like anything that we possess or anything that we utilize, we should be taking care of it, right? And maintaining it on a regular basis. Um, so it's especially important for us to take good care and clean our feeders on a bi-weekly basis at the very least with either bleach or vinegar because there are all sorts of bacterial and fungal stuff that can get into our bird seed as a, as a result of, um, of built up condensation and moisture um, that can really cause our birds some harm. And one of those we see um, really being spread through bird populations like house finches is avian conjunctivitis. Now, even though hey, that is, yeah. One, one quick thing, I just want you to watch the time because um, uh, if we have to end at a particular time, you may have a little bit more to go. We're at 4.55 now. Oh yeah, I see that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, so um, avian conjunctivitis predominantly affects our house finches, um, but we also see it in a few other finch species too, like goldfinches. So despite it being predominantly a respiratory infection affecting the lungs, we do see it manifest in symptoms of swollen and puffy eyes too, kind of liquid oozing from the eyes, um, lethargy, not being able to see well, things like that. Um, so if you do find a bird displaying symptoms of conjunctivitis, um, please do do your best to capture that bird and call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. That could be our center at Sharon, or that could be you logging into the DEEP's website and looking at their wildlife rehabilitation page. Um, because what happens is if we leave these birds at the feeders, because they're uncomfortable and their eyes are bothering them, they tend to rub those infected eyes all over the bird seed at the feeders. And then that just spreads like wildfire to other house finches that are coming to feed at that seed, right? So again, if you find a bird with avian conjunctivitis at your feeder, um, please do us a favor and do your best to capture it. And we'll do our best to help you get it to us for treatment. It is treatable and it's not necessarily a death sentence for these birds.
Okay, we're getting ready to transition over to Project Feeder Watch, right? And so that'll be a quick little zip through that. So we have um, enough time, at least five minutes for questions at the end. But I'd really just want to emphasize before making that transition that though we can do birds a favor by supplementing their natural diet with seed, where the real sustainability is when it comes to feeding our birds is planting native plants. I'm sure you guys have heard that buzzword, those buzzwords, native plants, a lot in the past few years, and for good reason. We know that biodiversity is declining across the world, and we know that our bird populations are also declining as a result of the quality of habitat. So by planting native plants for birds, um, you can really help them by providing plants for them that host lots of insects that they feed their babies during the summertime. But also, like you see here for our American robin, they can provide really important food sources during the wintertime like berries, right, with American holly, or it can provide birds with really important critical cover for those cold winter nights and if a predator is nearby. So by logging onto Audubon's website and looking at their initiative, Plants for Birds, you can actually do as little as typing in your zip code to a database. And that database will give you a really awesome comprehensive list of plants that are native to your region, right? If you live in Connecticut, they're not gonna give you plants from California, right? That would make any sense, but they're gonna give you plants from this region that you're gonna be able to plant to help birds out. So do check that out if you haven't already become familiar with it. Okay, now here's where the kind of scary part comes in, folks. I'm gonna transition over to Project Feeder Watch's website and I'm gonna hope that this transition goes smoothly. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my share here. All right, now I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna initiate my share again. All right. All right, I think everybody should be able to see this. Okay, so feeder watch, I want you to type into the chat box for me and tell me, yes, if you are familiar with feeder watch and if you have participated at least one year. Yes, Betty, Kelly, Susan. Yes, Judy, yes, lots of yeses, but some no's. I love the no's too, that's great, okay. All right, folks, so many of you have, some of you haven't, that's wonderful. What Project Feeder Watch is, is a community science initiative that is sponsored by the Cornell Lab and Birds Canada, essentially to encourage everyday folks like us to count birds for science. This initiative is very near and dear to my heart because before I really knew anything about birds and when I just simply loved watching birds, I signed up for Feeder Watch and I started to learn what my birds were in my backyard in Michigan. Right, so I started learning birds, I started becoming more familiar with them, but then I also felt empowered by being able to act as a sort of scientist in taking down data and submitting that again when I knew really nothing about birds at that time. So if you're new to this and this is something you're interested in, I hope this will empower you to, to become part of the scientific community and submit your observations to Project Feeder Watch. I love honestly, truly just kicking my feet up on a winter morning having my cup of coffee ready and just watching the feeder birds here at Sharon Audubon and doing a quick count. So I'm gonna show you guys really quickly how easy it is to sign up and only a couple of steps that it takes to be able to submit that info. Okay, so really quickly, I know we're running really short on time. So let's look at um, feederwatch.org. Uh, you guys can log on to that and explore here. They have lots of really good information about um, what the initiative is about. You can access Common Feeder Birds, this interactive website that teaches you a lot about common feeder birds, um, unusual birds, illnesses. There's a whole treasure trove of info on this website for you guys. But how to participate. Okay, if we scroll down here, right, you're gonna choose your site, right? It's gonna have you sign up for account and enter in some basic information about your backyard. You're gonna count the birds that you see over a two day period. And there are some specific counting instructions, but you guys can, um, they'll inform you of that when you register for a count. And then all it takes afterwards is a really easy um, few step process to enter your data online. And if you're more comfortable with using your smartphone, you can also submit your information via smartphone there. Okay, all right. So here we can sign up. You are going to click whether you're in the US or Canada since it's hosted by two conservation orgs in both of those countries. And then it's gonna have you select um, you know, your payment tier. If you're a member, they're gonna give you a membership price. If not, it's just $18.
and then you'll sign up here and then they will mail you a packet and they'll contain some instructions on um, counting once you receive that packet. All right, so I'm gonna stop my share here. Um, I ran a little short on time. And so um, if anybody has any questions about submitting the data, I'd be happy to provide some more info on that at the end. Um, but I'm just gonna go back here. Oops. Sharing again is always kind of a tricky process. All right, back here. All right, so you guys should be seeing my slides now. Woo. Okay, whoop, sorry guys. All right, we're gonna go ahead from current side. Okay, great. So now um, really, again, this is quick review of protocol but you're watching birds for two days in a row with feeder watch. You're entering your observations um, with the highest number of birds being recorded. And again, there's more specific info in the packet. Um, you have your entering of data either by the website or the feeder watch app. And your data matters because, um, uh, I'm worried you guys can't see my screen, but your data really matters because it's essentially telling us where birds are and where they aren't by entering your feeder watch data. Right, and that can tell us whether there's something up with the food supply, if there's some environmental factor that's affecting our birds, right, and causing them to divert from their usual wintering grounds, or if there's a prevalence of disease, right, going through the population and affecting them. So the more we know via the data we submit, the more informed our conservation efforts ultimately are. All right, everybody, sorry I had to rush through the end of that. That is the conclusion of today's program. And so now I will open it up for any questions that anybody has here, if anybody's willing to stay on for a few minutes. Um, before you go to the questions, I have a, I was looking at them and many of the participants were answering them for each other. So- Oh, that's wonderful. So what a great model. And, and because we are so short of time, I want to be careful that um, everyone knows that any of the questions that were not answered, we're going to try to follow up with you because you've identified yourself with your question and get back to you with an email response. But um, one thing that did come out was uh, someone offered that the, um, the shells, the black sunflower shells that are less expensive, but be careful because the shells can get in the way of some plant growth. When, in, in, when uh, from year to year, so that might be one thing. And the safflower, uh, another po uh, positive about the safflower seeds is that the squirrels don't like it. That's another great point. Yeah, thank okay, you to so, whoever mentioned that. They can be a squirrel deterrent for sure, so thank you. Okay, and um, again, only because I'm afraid we're gonna lose people. Um, we'd love to do more Q and A's, but we might lose people before they go. We had a few, first of all, thank you, Bethany. It was a terrific presentation. I learned so much and it's so great to be back to nature and feel like <laughs> um, And thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we arranged for Sharon Audubon to join us with this presentation to help us though, to fund our fee to Sharon Audubon and to support the library's programming going forward. We hope you'll consider a contribution to the Cornwall Library. It's easy, there's a donate button on our website. Number two, um, we've recorded the program. And if you were listening so carefully and weren't, couldn't take notes, it'll be available in the next couple of days on the Cornwall Library's YouTube page, accessible on our website. So if you just look for the YouTube icon, you'll find it. And third of all, we're gonna go further into these native plants next time. Don't we forget, March 13th, is our part two of this program. We'll be looking more to spring then, and you'll get more about the plants you were wanting to know about that are native and great for the birds we want to protect here. So thank you everybody for coming, and thank you, Bethany, that was super. I enjoyed it immensely. Good. Very good. Again, I wish I, I yeah, I, I wish I would have had a little bit more. Thank you, everybody, uh, to go in and talk a little bit more about Project Feeder Watch. Um, but again, you know, please don't hesitate at any time, folks, to follow up with me afterwards if you do have more questions about Feeder Watch and, and how it works. Um, again, I, I really hope it at least uh, made everybody aware, those who are new to Feeder Watch, that it's really quite approachable and it is a really easy way for us to become, again, these community scientists and really apply ourselves to bird conservation by submitting our observations. Again, while perfectly comfortable, feet kicked back at the feeder and with a cup of coffee in hand. I mean, what gets better than that? 
<laughs> Correct me, Bethany, if I'm wrong. I think Eileen Fielding uh, came into our chats from time to time. Some of the supplies that we were seeing are available at the center. You just have to call and order them. And yeah, that's get back right. To you, like the squirrel buster and other mm -hmm. things like that. And the poster, we can get you the information on that. So that does not open the store itself. You just call and you'll be able to get the information you need. Yeah, good. That's exactly right, Sandy. Yeah. So we do sell the squirrel buster. Again, if you have, if anybody's been having some chronic issues with squirrel infiltration, and uh, we have you covered there with some squirrel busters and all sorts of feeder accoutrements. But also, um, a lot of people have been really taking advantage of our bird seed too. And we do have quite a wonderful blend called our Northwest Corner Blend um, that facilitates a pretty wide variety of species at the feeder because it has the black oil sunflower, it has some peanut hearts, some um, cranberries, and it has a couple of other uh, seed types in there too that I can't recall at the moment, but it's a really hot blend and um, we're starting to have to purchase another order because it's really popular. So if you would like to purchase some bird seed from us, give us a call and I'll work that out with you. Hey everybody, we wanted to interest your time. So we will be back uh, at four o'clock, March 13th, focus on plants and the new birds. Take a look at your feeders. So let's see what's gonna be different when we gotta get together next time, which ones aren't there anymore and who's new. Okay, thanks yeah. again everybody. Have a great rest of the weekend. Yeah, thank you everybody so much. Take care. <laughs>